I'm here at the sixth FIP Pharmaceutical Sciences World Congress, and with me is Professor Maria Jose Alonso from the University of Santiago de Compostela. Professor Alonso, it's our last day here in Stockholm. What are your impressions of the Congress? Well, my overall impression is really, really good. I have to say that I like attending these FIP conferences because basically what you listen to here is, is the whole spectrum of medicine, going from the drug discovery, drug delivery areas to drug development, and even the use of medicines in clinical practice. Uh, so that went really well in that sense. I have to say that I am particularly interested in the precision medicine, this kind of medicines that go to specific segments of the population with a specific disease, suffering a specific disease. And um, in this specific area, I learn a lot about how to, not only how to design these drugs, but also how to manufacture them, and how to make the best use of them. That was quite amazing for me. So you've been sharing your knowledge about nanopharmaceuticals. Can you explain what these are and what benefits they may have? Sure. Uh, for me, a nanopharmaceutical is a, a drug that is associated to a carrier which has a nanometric size. Drug plus the carrier, nanopharmaceutical. So what the carrier does is to drive, to take the drug to the right place and helps the drug overcoming all the biological barriers that drugs encounter in their way to their targets. So by doing so, we get important benefits. For example, the toxicity of the drug is reduced because it goes straight to the right place, and also the efficacy is enhanced because of the same reason. In addition to this, there are some ideas of making these uh, some specific uh, drugs more attractive for patients in the sense that we can change a formulation from an injectable to an oral formulation just because of the use of these nanocarriers helping drugs overcoming barriers. So how can the particles um, improve the drug delivery to the target tissue? Well, the way they do is um, giving, I would say, uh, giving some intelligence to the drug. In other words, the drug doesn't know where to go. You inject the drug into the bloodstream and it goes everywhere. If you put the drug together with a nanoparticle and the nanoparticle has a ligand that knows where to go, like a signal that gives the particle where to go, the drug will go to the, to the right place by using this vehicle with the adequate direction. You're also the um, principal investigator and coordinator of several cooperative projects that are financed by the WHO, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, or the European Commission. What is the benefit of this way of working? I really like this way of working, and actually all my current projects uh, are now in the form of consortia. I, I like it because by working in such, with such a model, we are interacting with people from different areas, different backgrounds, with different perspectives. For example, I like working with people from molecular biology or cell biology, you know, with uh, experts on immunology, on toxicology, and by having the possibility to work together with all these groups of people, I think at the end the output of the project is much richer. I also like uh, having in this consortia people like from, from uh, industry and also clinicians because they really know where the problem is, how to develop a product. So their advice is really good for you know, the translation of our ideas into the clinical practice. In 2010, you've been ranked among the top 10 scientists in pharmacology. Um, how have you found working in such a male-dominated field? Well, I have to say that I don't feel bad, but uh, at the same time, I recognize that in the early years of my career, I remember feeling kind of intimidated being in a room surrounded by men, and I was like, 
you know, with limited self-confidence, just because there were not more women in the room, I sometimes felt that I shouldn't speak up because maybe my ideas were not so clear, that maybe their competences were more important than mine. So I think I had to overcome this limited self-esteem, which was highly influenced by the fact that there were very few women around. I have to add to this that, in fact, there are lots of women in research, especially in medical, biomedical sciences. However, unfortunately, most of them are at the PhD level, postdoctoral level, but there are not many full professors or, you know, women holding, you know, uh, high responsibilities like presidents of societies. Well, this is not the case for this society. We have more and more women. I, I hope we can continue going that way. And what advice could you give young women scientists? I would say that the main advice should be um, think very high of yourself, as higher as possible. You need to be absolutely confident about your capacity, and you need to, you know, to to fight in order to reach your goals. Of course, that's always very important. But if you choose the right job, the right kind of activity, research I think is fascinating. If you choose research, for example, I think you have to put all energy there and to be convinced that your ideas are great, at least as great as the ideas from other people who may be male. Um, and uh, I would also say that it is perfectly compatible having a family life and having a highly demanding job, high professional level, because very often people say that this is not possible to do both things, and I honestly think that this is totally feasible. Of course, if you organize your life in the proper way, if you choose the right partner, and if you do so, I think you will be a very good example for your children. Thank you so much. This is Juno Grahman reporting for FIP.